So it's actually, thanks again for having me. Uh, just to mention, I just arrived actually yesterday after midnight. I didn't sleep, so uh, I fall asleep while you're in. So try to be active with me so I can. <laughs> so that I don't go sleep. So uh, I have been invited here, and uh, honestly, I'm maybe the least person should be uh, invited for talking in competition linguistics because actually I have the masters here. So Dr. Shalan, Dr. Bizarre, everyone here actually are you are the ones who we are, we are learning from. Uh, so I decided actually to talk more about not just computational linguistics for Arabic, but actually its application, because actually this is one of the main uh, research areas I'm working on right now, which is uh, applying the social media analysis, what we call computational social science, and uh, what, kind of, what kind of NLP tools we would require for having an effective one. Maybe give some examples and show you uh, some stuff here. So first of all, this talk, it gives you quickly a bit of my journey from what I have been started as developing te uh, technologies for processing language, especially in Arabic, to developing technologies actually to understand people. And I have a big focus on understanding the Arab people in different areas. Uh, so I will start actually by, the, I think that the, the project would make me shift from uh, NLP and IR to computational social science, which actually generating news from social media. Then uh, we will discuss some examples about how to understand that we can use technology to understand user behavior online. And uh, examples from the Arab world. Actually, I have different examples, but I'm focusing here on the Arab world only. And then what kind of technologies we require to be able to have a, an effective analysis? And what should be next? What is required? What is, what is missing? in Arabic that is a little other language that we need to work on in Arabic. So as a quick introduction about myself, so as uh, you know, I think you know that I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, assistant professor at the University of Edinburgh, and I've been there for two years exactly. But actually, I have been doing research for almost like 13 or 14 years now. So I started from by working at IBM, then I moved to Microsoft, uh, doing applied research. I, I got my PhD from Dublin City University, then I worked for around four and a half years uh, in QCRI, then I decided to move to academia. And during that period, actually, my main expertise started from NLP, then I shifted more to information retrieval, then currently, actually, I'm doing specifically computational social science. And this is the journey I'd like to share with you about how this happened, and I hope that some of you will switch actually to this area, which I think we have a lake for our researchers in this area. Okay? I can actually name, I can name it for you all those working in this area, Arab, uh, Arab, so working in this area, which can be like four or five. So one thing actually about the Arabic on the internet, this is actually the, the, the statistic from 2018 about the, Arab, the, the internet users. And you can see actually Arabic is the fourth largest number of users online. So uh, actually our people are existing on the internet. And this actually on the usage, but if you check the growth, it's by far the largest growing language on the internet. So we need to develop technologies to capture this. This is actually growing from 2000 to 2018. By far we are actually like 9,000 percent. That's the second one is less than half of our growth, which is Japanese. So there are more content in Arabic that are growing, and more internet users in Arabic are actually are existing. So this is important that all of us develop the technology that we would support that and understand the needs of these people as well. Okay, so I will discuss with one of the projects that they worked on like four or five years ago. Uh, which was related to information retrieval, but later on it made me change my mind and well, actually my research area and interest to do more about social media analysis. So uh, this was actually creating an Arabic news website that is automatically generated. And the main idea here actually for when, when I started this project with my group, that we know that the news media websites are biased. This is a clear thing, anyone can say that. If you're focused, listening to the news from Foxy News, it would be different from CNN. The same thing from Arabia to British Al Jazeera here. Everyone is showing his point of view. 
and they, they should actually focusing on the part of the news they would like to focus on. But unlike social media, actually, you will find people discussing everything. Actually, you find even some parts of the news which is reported on social media not reported in the news websites. And actually, sometimes a news website is making a headline about something, no one cares about it. So, and the good thing, actually, you find the comments even on the news as well, and people are discussing it. So we started a larger project five years ago saying, can we use what is in social media to generate the news? Can you, can you just use consult social media, for example, Twitter? to tell me what is happening here, what's happening in Dubai, what's happening in Egypt, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, what's happening in any, of any place I want. Can I get the news from there? So we created at that time what's called Tweet Bookers. Actually, it has been running until last year, but it actually, and it, it was actually running automatically running. There is no one behind it. There's no editor behind it. And simply, it was showing the news about each country in the Arab region and even about politics and about sports, about technology, about everything, and it was automatically generated from what is there on Twitter. So what is Twitter? Well, this was actually, this is how it would uh, look like. So simply, this is the news about Syria. You can see, you have headlines about news running, and this is at, at one of the topics, and actually here you can find the top trending tweets about what's happening in Syria. And this is one of the articles about that generated automatically. And you can simply actually, and this actually was done by processing a daily around 20 million Arabic tweets. Getting it, processing it, understanding what is in, underneath it, it's created to Syria, it goes to Syria, it's uh, then find, find out within Syria what are the stories there, create a story, create uh, uh, an image for it, and create a headline for that. And it was 100% automated. There is no single person standing behind it. It was an AI machine doing that. And it had different categories. We had politics, which was the main thing, but it has also you can find advertisement, uh, uh, sports, economy, uh, culture, and technology, and everything. And it was showing the trending news here, showing even multimedia. So you can see what are the trending here text or the trending actually, for example, pictures about what's going on in Syria. You can get what is the most trending ones during the last 20 hours here, actually, the last couple of days, you can select last hour, last 12 hours, or something like that. And of course, the top news happening, the top stories within that category, and it allows you to search for anything. If you think that there is something you're interested in not covering the news, you can search for it and get a summary of what's happening. And it was actually even a mobile application on Android and iOS at that time. And we had around actually 3,000 visits per day. So how this works? Simply, it has main three components. Streaming the tweets, which we mentioned are 20 million tweets every day. Information filtering, which is the main component here about finding if the tweet is related to a certain topic or not. Then the presentation. And there was the back end by using solar and doing some tweet analysis like story fiction and justification. But here I'm focus on the part, the technological part about information filtering. How we can find that a certain tweet is related to a certain topic. So, the basic thing about finding tweets on a certain topic is Boolean search, simply. It's actually finding a tweet has a certain word. So if I'd like to get the news about uh, Emirates, I can just use the word Emirates, Dubai, uh, will be uh, maybe the name of the politicians here, and any tweet containing that would just come. The good thing about this, actually, you'll get some tweets and mostly it would be relevant because you actually have very specific words which you know that would be relevant. But the problem you would be missing a lot of stuff. News is changing every day. And news things happening every couple of hours, especially in the Middle East. So if there is an accident happens, if there is actually especially in places like Syria, attacked by Russians, attacked by whatever, by ISIS, whatever, news are changing all the time. How do you capture that? You cannot always put the words that are correct there. One basic approach actually in information field is to apply what's called the query expansion by doing some term summation. So I can get some tweets and find out what are the other terms appearing a lot with these tweets. So I can, I can learn that maybe there is a conference here in Dubai about other technologies. And in this case I word the word conference and I start adding and collect tweets related to that. 
But the problem, when I do that, actually, the good thing is I'll get a much larger volume of tweets. But the problem, the majority of them would be actually not relevant because it, if I learn the word conference, it can be any conference. It doesn't have to be the one I'm looking for. So we thought about what about using machine learning in this case? What about actually using the tweets that we collected to be irrelevant, we think it's relevant, and then select a random set of tweets and assume they are in random set of tweets. And, and just use them to train a classifier. And this classifier hopefully would just classify any tweet coming to be relevant or not. When we did that, it turned actually to be very similar to this one. Simply because it classifier learned that anything matching my queries is relevant and anything else is not. So the classifier was turned out to be very biased to what I have actually introduced to it. So we did a very simple trick in this case. We think that this term selection, we selected some nice terms that really can be useful, but the problem is they are not always relevant. Sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. So what we did actually, we decided to filter out from the random set of tweets any tweet containing these terms to make the random sample totally away from being rel possibly relevant. And hopefully the classifier will decide by itself this term is relevant or not depending on the full tweet, not just one term. And we, because of business news, this was apply, updated every four hours. We had apply different, like we, we train on last 24 hours of tweets, and we update this model every four hours, because news is changing a lot. We try different windows, and four was the optimal one. If you train it 24 hours, you miss a lot of stuff, because news are changing a lot. And if you make it less, it might be actually very uh, overfitting. And when we did that, actually, we got good number of more tweets, and a small reduction in the precision. And this is actually how tweeting with this running has been running for five years. Just to give you an example, one of the tweets that we got in 2014 as related to sports was this one. <laughs> Do you know what, what they were talking about? This tweet was talking about? Football match. Hmm? Yeah, football match. What? Football match. Football match. Which one? It was related as a sports at the time. The classifier can find it as a sports. Do you know what was it talking about in 2014? The match of Brazil and Germany. It was ended by 7-1. Although this tweet has nothing related to sports, nothing, but the classifier learned it at that specific point of time that 7-1 is a very strong feature about sports. So it was a strong feature by itself enough to say that this is actually a sports tweet. If this tweet appeared two days later, it would not be relevant because the model would be updated at that time and nothing would be similar. So this is actually how it works. So we created at that time this web page. I think it's there, but it's not running. Uh, it's automatically generated news websites driven by public in this case, not by news editors, which was the main thing. What the real people think would be there, anything, even if it's fake news. This is what people are saying, what's happening. And it's used unsupervised learning for detecting the news and covers all the topic, politics, uh, all the political uh, topics in other countries plus other categories that you have seen. <coughs> but actually, this platform get me to change my research directions at some point. It happened when I was following this platform on the 3rd of July 2013. Do you know what is that date? It was the date, the date in Egypt, yeah, when actually the, uh, the Morsi was, uh, was the, uh, outed by the, uh, the, uh, the army at the time. So it was really interesting because till the 2nd of July 2013, anyone will see our website, you say, you created a website to attack the Muslim Brotherhood and support the army. On the 4th of July, anyone would see this website and say, you created a website to support the Muslim Brotherhood and attack the army. A huge flip happened on the news reported on that automated website. That actually created, was a strong question for me, just to understand what happened 
happened, how it happened, and why it happened. This was a big motivation for me to understand. Okay, it seems that trending news before the second, the third of July was everyone was against the regime at Morsi at that time and supporting the army to intervene. And after that, it seems everyone changed his mind. What happened? So this was more about the social research question. And this relates to, so actually we contact the social scientists at the time to understand it. Social science actually learning about people and the society in general. So we learn stuff about how people behave, how it makes something you're trending, what does it, what, who does what. And this has been studied for decades, actually for centuries, about how people understand, do, do social science by sitting with people, doing interviews, understanding how people behave. But since the social media trends up, Facebook, Twitter, uh, even now is, uh, Snapchat, people started to be behaving online. Our trends, our behavior is, can be captured with a huge amount of data. So with big data of human behavior, we could model actually, we can understand with some machine learning, we can understand this behavior and predict even the future. And this was the main thing, and this is why it's called computational social science. At that moment, we, I started to explore more about this topic. So simply, what's computational social science? Have a research question related to social science. How people behave, what is trending, uh, and what actually is uh, spotting the misbehavior in the behavior of people. But the methodology you're using is computational. You're using text network analysis or machine learning, NLP, information people, everything related to computational methods. And the data you have is huge, big data, from social media and some actual and log data. So the outline of the meaning of this talk is, I'm going to talk about three examples of computational social science applied to the hard data, which one related to changing the opinion, the one which I mentioned now, some others about the background of people to support a specific group or a person, and another one about the religion of social media and the art world, which is a big thing. And I will discuss another three examples of technologies that is required for supporting this kind of analysis. One of them is speech recognition, one is very famous sentiment analysis, another is accusive language detection. And what are the missing stuff for the future directions? So changing the opinion in Egypt was our routine. So we noted that change on tweeting was at that time. So we said, okay, let's forget about what we see, let's do it quantitatively. Let's data drive us and drive what is conclusions we have. So we collected six million tweets about what is the main actors in Egypt between the 21st of July, actually it was this June, not July, sorry, it's a mistake, before that, before the big uh, protest against Morse at the time, till the 3rd of September, which is actually after all the major events happened afterwards. And we labeled the tweets to be pro or anti military intervention people who will support the army to intervene, or people who were actually against it. And we sent them 1,000 twe uh, tweets, trained and classified to label the remaining of the 16 <coughs> tweets. And we could actually achieve an accuracy of 85% for labeling, which is okay, so we can do the analysis. And we started to do some analysis about what is the volume of tweets changing during that period. This is actually what we found. This is what we noticed, but this is actually quantitatively. Before the 3rd of July, everyone was supporting the army get in and get rid of mercy. After the 4th of July, everyone was saying the army should be out and get back mercy. This is crazy. What happened? People changed their mind that fast? What do you think what happened? It was a question, actually. To, to understand this. So let's study on the user level. So identify within our collection 22,000 users who had at least five tweets during that period, these four months. And we examined the change in the stance in their tweets. They, if you have at least five tweets, they, they were supporting, they might start to be against, or against, start to be supporting. And we started to do in three confidence levels. They usually have only five tweets at least, and then those who have 10 tweets, and those who have at least 20 tweets. So if you have more tweets, so we can check the confidence on a higher level. 
And we, show, we check the changes between people who were pro-military intervention to start to be anti, or anti start to be pro. And this actually was the outcome. This is actually people who are changing in both directions. But where they were more from pro to anti. But what is the interesting part here? Actually, this is at different confidence levels. Let's say the highest confidence level, 20 tweets at least in their timeline. This is the percentage. Can you see the percentage of people changing their mind? Less than 2%. After five months, hundreds and thousands of people killed in, within the army and within the other side. And the number of people changing their mind was less than 2%. Then what is the problem with the volume we have seen? Did you see? The volume was a big change, but the user limits actually not change. What happened? Can you guess? Make it faster. We need to do the coffee break. <laughs> I need an answer. Not only with the users? With the users who will Yes, the people who feel unjust speaks more. Those who are supporters for Morsi at that time, when he was at the at, at position, they don't want to tweet a lot anyway. But those who want to get rid of him just be, have been vocal so much. When they're actually demand achieved, we are done. But the others feel the unjust to start to be more vocal. So actually what we learned here that the observing global change in trends doesn't mean change on the individual level. And the groups feeling unjust, unjust tends to be more vocal. And actually, it's not easy to ch have someone switching political belief. Actually, I gave this talk several times in places after Cambridge Analytica, telling them it's not easy for anyone to change one's opinion. It's really not easy. So if you are discussing with a friend a different opinion, don't waste your time. Okay? Everyone speak to his for, for a long time. It's not easy. Okay, so this is what we learned. The other thing, and this is to support, people supporting ISIS. I know this is actually all like <laughs> topics, it's a bit uh, sticky, but let's see what about that. Again, on tweet movements that is not directed by any editor. It's what is on social media. We notice people supporting ISIS. People are very happy that ISIS is actually killing people, which was super crazy for anyone. Who would be doing that? So we collected 3 million tweets mentioning ISIS. And we started to see if what are the signals to be actually supporting or against it, so we can do our analysis. And it was actually straightforward. If you say about ISIS in the full name, as Dawla Islamiya, recognize it as a state, 93% will be supporting it. If you say it as a short term, ISIS or Daesh, 78% you are against it. That was pretty easy. Just the way you mention it tells how you actually, uh, your stance towards it. So we selected 57,000 users who mentioned ISIS at least 10 times in their timeline in either direction. And in this case, we are sure with a 99% confidence to be these users are against or with supporting it. And we turned out that 11,000 were showing their sympathy with ISIS supporting it, and 46 were showing being against it. So we started to collect the tweets of these users, their timeline. 123 million tweets. And we started to identify the period before they ever mentioned ISIS, before ISIS appears. We have their timeline up to five years back. ISIS appeared at that, it was in 2014, so ISIS at that time has been there out for one or two years. And we started to filter out accounts with no pre-ISIS mentions. So if the account appeared after ISIS, who cares? We just will focus on what are people before doing that. So simply what we did, this is the timeline from going like that, and once you find the first mention, we make a cutoff and say, this is the date of your first event, before ISIS ever appeared. 
So let, we want to see if we can predict from the pre-data, the data you have before ISIS period, that is you in the future going to be a supporter of ISIS or not from your tweets, your interactions before that. So we collected seven, around 7,000 users, uh, oh, 8,000 users through ISIS, which is the full collection, and we get a surrender sample from those who are anti-ISIS, and we try to classify with the data before ISIS ever appeared or mentioned in their timeline. And we wanted to predict their user stats in the future. And the feature we used was just bad forms. Can we predict from the tweets of a user in 2013 that this user in 2014 will be supporting or be against ISIS? And the class strategy of the accuracy of 87% accuracy. Which was scary, actually. We can predict your behavior in the future. This was not the main thing we wanted. We started to do some feature analysis. What are the main features for the classifier to be able to see these people are going to be blue or anti? And quickly, this is what we got. Through anti before, this is actually the main focus on the before period. What you can get here, you will find stuff about things, people who are against the regimes in general, Arab regimes, in different countries. And the other ones actually is very general. Even those who are anti that pointing at actually they were doing something about the Abu Dhabi, uh, a fishing market, I don't know why. But it was more interesting for this one. The common feature between those who showed some support for us in the future that it was related to the Arab Spring or related to protesting against, against regimes. We have seen that from Egypt, Syria, Libya, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq. This was really interesting. So we started to dig in depth in these accounts and read their tweets with our social scientists and political scientists. And for example, I give you a sample of the one of the users from Egypt. This user in 2012, he was saying, <laughs> <laughs> this guy was supporting of the Egyptian revolution and he was unhappy with the progress of the revolution in 2012. In 2014, he was saying, ah, yes, I'm a supporter of ISIS, but I'm going to see the movie of uh, uh, Christopher Nolan, which actually was interested at that time. And after one week, he was saying, this is the case of Bashar's uh, soldiers being slaughtered by the Islamic State. He goes to the cinema. And after one week, he watches ISIS killing people, and he's amazed. This was not one example. We had examples from many users like that. We couldn't find a signal for this user to be actually extremists or even religious. I was expecting in 2012, 2011, they were supporters for, for example, Al Qaeda, they, uh, they upgraded. But it turned out they actually, they are normal people. So it turned out actually that the support of ISIS is not ideological. It turned out to be actually for revenge. By the way, we're talking about 2014. This might change it now. I think it might totally change it now because ISIS at that time was had some glory showing for some people who doesn't understand. But it was at the time after the peaceful revolutions for some people failed in their opinion, they wanted to find who's fighting now. It was ISIS that supported. So the aim of my enemy is my friend. But this guy, he doesn't know that ISIS would kill him for being going to the cinema, for example. This is another interesting thing we can learn about people. So the lesson here that social data allows to understand kind of behavior of users. And our hypothesis, hypothesis about user might be limited. Because our initial hypothesis that these people were extremists. But it turned out it's not at all, actually. Of course, there was something for a single for extremists. But mainly, the general thing was they were just normal people that wanted to support ISIS. 
The last thing about religious presence on social media. This is something we, uh, we started recently, we didn't even publish it yet, but something we are working on. The main idea is actually which the Arabs are, I think, characterized by compared to the other people is it's very common in our case that people share Quran on their social media. So we wanted to understand, okay, how people share Quran on social media, what kind of are sharing, and any differences between people and pages in sharing Quran, and what are the most popular shared verses in Quran, for example. So we started with collecting tweets which has the words the words which can show there is might be a Quran verse there. So we collected around 5.4 million tweets over two years, and we started we created a, a Quranic subtractor or parser, and we collected around 2.6 million tweets, which we know it really had Quran in this, but the others were actually some noise because it can be something this one can be in any tweet. And this is coming from 650,000 users. So we want to even to label some of these users. We label the most active 1,000 users who they were tweeting the lot. Uh, to being a person or a page, is it uh, this account for a person or actually for a page or an interest group or a company? And is it a normal account for a normal person or actually just for religious content exclusively? This is coming from a, sh uh, a sheikh or something like that. So uh, and especially from Saudi Arabia, we have a lot of accounts from, like, from uh, famous uh, scholars. And we started doing some analysis about sharing verse and fragments. What about the Quran categories? We found this nice website which categorized Quran to 14 general categories and 174 subcategories. And the general categories of the Quran verses is this one, so this is a translation. Stuff about Sharia law, about uh, stories of the prophets, worship, jihad, Muhammad, God. These are the main things covered in the Quran. And we wanted to see the volume of shared of each of these verses. So the most shared topic, what do you think is it from these ones? Worship. Worship, okay. We have one vote for worship. Anything else? Jihad. Jihad would be the number one. This actually one of the things we would like we wanted to understand as well. Anything else? Hmm? Sins. Sins. What is the most covered, you think, topic of this within the Quran itself? Forget about the sharing on social media. Stories. Stories. Yeah. So, this is the distribution of the verses in Quran itself, the blue one, the light blue, and this is actually the volume of tweets, people sharing it. So in Quran itself, you find the majority of verses is coming from these two things, the uh, hereafter and unseen, the Wabiyat, where Jannah and Nar, uh, or stories about the prophets, which are the very common two things. Unlike the volume of the tweets, the majority is coming from Sharia law. People are, Sharia law includes how to pray, how to do zakat, it doesn't have to be in the Hulud, it's actually Hulud is a very minor part of it. But it's mainly about uh, Sharia law, about praying things. And the second one is worship. The third one is Muhammad, and then comes other ones. So the distribution is different. How this is different from one account type to another? We mentioned we have people, we have pairs of pages, and we have religious content uh, exclusive, and there is normal accounts. And this is the difference. This is uh, the religious content, page and human, and the other, the normal ones. As you can see, those who actually are doing kind of preaching online, either a page or a human, they focus a lot, yes, like on here after uh, on scenes, but actually they focus more on worship. Asking people how to pray, how to make do apps, stuff like that. But for the normal people and pages, they focus a lot on, again, Sharia law and the stories. So even there are some differences between the account types on social media about this stuff. The top shared verses and fragments of verses in Quran. Any idea which, which would be the most common verse shared in Quran on social media? There are many 6,000, yeah, but... Okay, it's not. These are the top shared ones. 
And the other is, and actually you can see here the Mohammedans because you can share it easily on Twitter. But these are the top shared food verbs. And about fragments, these are the top ones. What you would notice here that the focus of these things is mainly about mercy and forgiveness of God, about actually uh, uh, being optimism and uh, having optimism in the future, like for example, if I have a Angina or uh, I don't know, what, uh, this different things like I can't remember all of them, but this is a general thing you can think. It's not exactly what we could have expected when we started this. So the observations we have may account on of various interests shared for on social media. The distribution it was interesting that the interest of people is different than the distribution of the Quran. Maybe if we assume that uh, God wants the distribution of uh, the course of topic is based on the volume of it, on the, the shared distribution of it in the Quran, people have a different distribution. And preaching accounts share more verses on hereafter and worship, while other people focus on more on Sharia and making uh, a salah or a salah Muhammad salah. And the top shared verses focus more on mercy and forgiveness of God, optimism about future, and asking for protection. It was interesting that uh, jihad was actually only 6% in Quran and on shared. It's not that. And the top shared verse in jihad, by the way, was uh, which actually again about being optimistic about the future. So it's not even used about the jihad itself. So the lessons here, by the way, this is study is still under investigation. It's not finished yet. We now have, have something about what and how it's kind of answered, but the initial finding there is some hypothesis about the psychological status of people in music Quran. And so we need actually this is what we're trying to do now more like social psychological analysis of why people share these kind of things, which actually would require some interviews with people, and our collaborator on this is going to do that. She's a Saudi Arabian working in Microsoft, so uh, you might know her, but she actually, this is, this is the, we lack people like that in this field to work with conditional people to have this kind of analysis. Okay, this is the part where we are talking about how we can analyze social media. Now, what are kind of tools we need? for social media. You are the computational linguistic people, and we are doing NLP. What NLP tools do you think we need? So let's talk about the Arabic social media data. What are the characteristics there? First of all, it's dialects. Actually, it's multi dialects And some dialects are really different from each other. So you, once you go from the Maribi to uh, Gulf, you have a lot to change. And it's noisy. How to find your relevant data? It's sarcastic and indirect. When we discuss this, we use a lot of sarcasm in our data. It's a lot of abusive and offensive data, especially when people discuss this stuff, we won't discuss it peacefully. They have a lot of insults and things like that. There's a lot of spam as well. People are misusing hashtags in a big way. And there is fake accounts and actually bots there. It's a highly noisy data. So what kind of technologies will we need with this data? So there is definitely a new set of technologies that are required to be built. Other than what we are working on for years, partial speech tagging, uh, segmentation, yes, it's required still, but there are more additional stuff to be done. And here we are talking about dialects, not MSA. MSA is much easier as rules, as stuff. MSA, ma'arifish, it's part of it. Ma'arifish, it's, it's, it's more. We, I know you do. I know that you do it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's a rule, by the way. Match negation. It's a rule. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's more complicated than MSA. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, and I went for both. Uh, God would be different uh, one tools. So one of the things actually we're working on is a speech hack detection. Who heard about speech hack detection before? Three. Okay. So this is the thing that we need more data stuff for social media. So simply speech app is a speaker intention from a sentence. This is actually very useful in analyzing the conversations on social media. Is it the intention is assertion, recommendation, expression, question, request, or miscellaneous, which actually anything else? This kind of things we need at this part to tell that in English you will find it in a huge number of papers in that. In other words, actually it's only one paper on phone calls. There is nothing. 
So for this data, actually, we had to create a new data set for that. We created a we did set called RSAS. It has been published in uh, the last uh, OSAC uh, uh, workshop. And it's 21,000 tweets labeled for both the speech act and for sentiment. It's available online, you can download and use it. Just try to build things to solve this problem. So if you can see here, the problem with the speech act is highly unbalanced. Most of them actually is expression and assertion, and the remaining are very small amount of data. It's really hard to find a question on social media or a request or a recommendation. It's mainly an expression or just an assertion. So to build a classifier to classify that, it's really challenging because once the data is unbalanced, it's more challenging classification task. So there was a master student work on this this year, and we tried the different three types of features for that, simply the back of words. This is one thing. We start to use even structural uh, uh, features like the punctuation, the mention, the hashtags, the links, the emojis, and the tweets. And then some syntactic features like part of speech tagging and length of the tweets. And we we tried linear models like SVM, but it absolutely failed. So we had to go with bias and even with word embeddings, and we trained 100 million uh, uh, based on 100 million to a million hundred tweet for that. And this is actually the best performance we achieved. I need to focus on the macro F1. Macro F1 is a performance over both classes. 0.5. In English, the state of the art is 0.75. We are far behind behind that. But this is the first trial, it's not bad. It's like we're doing very well for some classes, but for some classes the program because it's 334. It's a small amount. You are doing that. How you can do that? How you can solve this problem? So this is one of the things that we need to solve here. And this is one of the new tasks we should think of. The other thing actually is sentiment analysis. That's good. Sentiment analysis in Arabic is not something new. So there has been there has been attempts for sentiment analysis for years, but for dialect, I think it started in 2012 by Abdul Murad and uh, uh, Abdul Majid. Abdul Majid actually is pioneering in this area. And there have been multiple corpus from 1,000 to 10,000 tweets, even the one we mentioned, 21,000. And uh, you will find the labels usually also made in neutral and crafted based on the lexicon most of the time. And there is a set event data which actually is a very useful one. It's a, a public data that was part of people participated in. I think you achieved the best group in that one. Yeah, we get, get a better result. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So it's around 10,000 again, and the best accuracy at the time was 58%. Again, compare it to English. We're doing since the last 50 days, by the way, it's the majority of classes 39, so it's still not random, but because we are talking about three classes. But we are still far behind what we really need to achieve. And the best approach actually is using lexicons, parsers, embeddings, and deep neural networks, correct? Because this, we are describing your results. Yeah. Sabah 
when it's possible. Uh, the famous uh, phrase in Egypt, I am Soda. <laughs> it's negative. So, and the good thing which I really like about this, when you write Salah, it's positive, so it's actually something which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can draw it. Oh, that's for the, you are trying to make it fail, okay. Sabah, full.
And I would say Luke. Anyone heard about Luke? One. Linguistic inquiry and word count. This is very famous one in English that we use for analyzing social media of the psychological part of the text. There we have a version in Arabic which is, is if you're creating one for a dialect, it would be great. So, for what? For standard. Yeah, but we need it for social media, so it's the problem, it's, it won't work. So, we can't put written dialects later, so that's fine. So this, there is a lot of things that we need to develop. And this actually, I would like briefly to mention my group uh, in Edinburgh. We have the SMASH group, Social Media Analysis and Support for Humanity. And these are the members. Actually, most of them are PhD students, and Tom and Ibrahim are actually research assistants. They are working on different parts on social media analysis. All of them are using Twitter. Only Lucy is using Reddit. But everyone else is using Twitter. And what we are doing, this is the activities we mainly be doing. We focus on user behavior analysis. This is our main concern in different things. Mental health, uh, 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 for example, politics, e-health, and uh, economics sometimes. This is our general thing. But we and some of them are doing the tools that we need to analyze, like sentiment analysis, stance detection, community, community detection, unsupervised machine learning. And we always focusing on the other issues that might arise about the bias of the data, the bots that might be there, the privacy issue. I'm detecting somebody is going to get access support in the future. I'm violating a lot of privacy issues here. This is why we have to delete the, we have to delete the data after doing the research, because we didn't want to share it with anyone. So, and then missions is everything. Politics, e-health, business, advertising, economic security, think of anything. So we are doing it, major majority is in English, but we still would like, I have two of them doing in Arabic, and there is a lot of research needs to be done. And by the way, most of this research about the social media studies has been covered by some of the, uh, actually one or two or more of this stuff, of these news uh, uh, sources. It's interesting always to understand about people and it's easy to communicate with people. Getting a 90% accuracy classifier, no one would care about the news, but if you say that uh, we understood how people are taking the of transporting or emitting ISIS, people that news would be interested. Uh, the conclusion I would like to say that computational social science is an emerging field in the world uh, that allows understanding online human behavior. We are in need of more research at researchers and research in the Arab world around this. It's important for us to understand our behavior, our differences, our similarities. We understand ourselves because every time we, just, we do the research, we turn out that we really could, we, we, did, we didn't have a good understanding of ourselves. And the new dimension of NLP tasks is emerging, and Arabic is still lack some support of this. So if there is one takeaway from this talk is, if we didn't do the research according to our interest, who would do it for us? This is a hopefully is a. Some of you with this motivation that go in one of these directions or think about that other direction that promotes doing more research in Arabic. And that's all for you. Thank you. And this is most of my collaborator in this work. I would like to thank you for the very interesting talk. And actually, you added lots to our knowledge and you opened a uh, lot of uh, research directions for us. And at the top of just to remember us. <laughs>